Hello and welcome to Board Game Gumbo. Today we're unboxing Merchant's Cove by Final Frontier Games. So we have the base game here. We also have the three character expansions and the secret stash. We'll get to those a little bit later. This is uh, quite a big game as you can see. So we're gonna need all the table space we can get. So let's just start with the base game for now. Merchant's Cove is a game for one to four players. It can play up to five if you have the character expansion boxes. Plays in 45 to 75 minutes. It is a Euro game uh, with variable player powers and not only player powers, but variable player boards. So let's see what we got in here. We got some very, very crinkly packaging. So this appears to be a lot of our character specific pieces. So let's just put those aside for a minute while we look for the main game board, because that's gonna help us uh, explain this a lot better. We've got a guide on how to put everything together. There are a lot of 3D elements in this game. So nice little guide just to show you how to do all that. Here's our rule book. So this is the main game board here, and this is the game board that essentially all players are going to share. You're gonna have boats up here, which are gonna have meeples on them, meeples being prospective clients. And those boats are going to dock at one of the three docks, although there are four spaces because there are two spaces for the center dock. And then once those meeples come off those ships, they're gonna funnel into the town and people are gonna be able to sell their goods to them. This is a fairly short rule book. Part of that is because um, the rules for each player are different. So we'll see that when we get to the specific player uh, teaching guides. So it looks like our main game board was with those first few things. So let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick. So it is one-sided, but instead of just leaving this back side blank, they have sort of a a map to the area on it, which is a nice little touch. And there is our game board. So it's a Euro. So obviously you're trying to score points. Your, your points are your money. So as you accumulate money, you're gonna be moving up on this point track. You have the cove itself at the top where the ships will be and the three docks. Here are essentially people you can hire throughout the course of the game. You have four guild halls here for the four different colors, as well as the Thieves Guild Hall, which plays a, a part in scoring points during the course of the game. And then you have the actual round tracker here. You're gonna play through three total rounds. And the way that this works is essentially the actions you take on your turn calls time, and you're gonna move up this track based off of how much time you spend on your actions with the active player being the person farthest back on the track. So now that we have sort of our main board here and a general understanding of how that works, we can look at the rest of our components. So these are uh, player boards for the different players. So these are specific to one of the roles in the game. This one, for instance, appears to be the alchemist board. So this board will go specifically to the alchemist. And this is where you'll put um, assistance that you'll hire. So the people that are out on the board, those cards, you can hire them and basically tuck them beneath this tile. And then this tile itself, this entire tile is an action you can take on your turn. And then you'll activate each one of these for if you have somebody associated with it. So here we have the rule books for the different characters in the game. So again, everybody shares this main board, but everybody's also going to have their own special board. And so like the captain will have her own board, which will look like this. We'll see it in a minute. And this is basically going to explain to you how to use that board, how to use your special actions. So each player will get one of these based off of who they choose to play. We've got the blacksmith here. The blacksmith is trying to create weapons and armor. 
to sell to um, the people coming into the cove. The alchemist is making potions, obviously, small potions and large potions. We've got the peddler. The peddler is the solo mode. So this isn't an option to play. This is who you play against if you play the solo mode. And then the chronomancer. The chronomancer is, I don't know exactly what he's doing. He, I think he's going back in time and trying to recover artifacts that he's selling to people. I don't know exactly what it is that he's selling up here. I don't know what those are, but um, he looks really interesting because he moves, he has two figures that'll move around the board. And then he's basically going through these portals to do different things. Let's see what else we have here. Looks like we've got, I guess these are stickers. I wonder if this is just a guide on where the pieces go in the, in the organizer. It looks like that's what it is. This is just showing you where the pieces are supposed to go once um, you put it all together in the organizer, which is kind of interesting. I, I wonder why it's on these sheets and not just in like a booklet, but it's certainly helpful. So then we have the player boards themselves. So here's the board for the Chronomancer and you can see that it's inset here. So it's that's nice. So the pieces don't slide around. On your turn, a player is going to move a piece. Now the Chronomancer is a little more complicated because he has two pieces, but you can essentially, you can see the locations that he can go to and the portals are also locations that he can go to. And then a location is gonna have a certain amount of time that it costs and then it's going to give them something for going there. So let's look at one that's a little less complicated and one that I know a little bit better. So here's the blacksmith. Again, nice little double layer board here for all your dice to sit in so they don't roll around. So the blacksmith can go to any one of these four locations and he's going to create a good based on the location he goes to. Either a small good in the right two or a large good in the left two. He needs a certain value on the dice to be able to do that. And these dice that you see here that are printed on the board, those are always going to be there. So there's always going to be a one here. There's always going to be a four here and so on. So whenever he goes to, let's say he goes here, he's going to spend one time. And depending on the combination of dice that are in this location, he can create a good. Now, if he has 10 or higher, He's going to create this good. If he has 12 or higher, he can create this good. But if he has less, he can still create a good. And this just means that he takes um, a cursed card. Another thing he can do is he can go here and that lets him set a die here. And that activates later in the game, it will activate these um, guild hall icons. And then the two locations that pretty much every player shares this one I think is what allows you to buy the uh, assistant cards. And then his main action here is basically he activates all of his things. So he goes here to place dice. He can go to each one to place dice. He can go here to place dice. And then when he goes here, he activates all of his dice. Here's the board for the AI, um, which I'm not very familiar with. So we'll kind of just show you that and skip. Here is the captain's board. So the captain has ships that she's going to move around. She can move to these interior spaces or she can move to these outside islands and she can also move here as well. And then you can see up here her six locations that she can activate. So here she can activate to fish. Anything that has a hook on it, she's going to activate. And the fish are her small resources that she's trying to sell. This is movement. This one here lets her spin a wheel and then move based off of that. And here she can dig up these treasures, which are going to be on the four islands. If she's got a ship here, she can activate this to pull up these artifacts, which are her large items that she's trying to sell. And then her two locations that everybody shares. And then finally in the main boxes, uh, at least is the alchemist. The alchemist is going to have a spot up here. You're gonna to have to put it together. It's a little 3D piece that the marbles are going to come down. And then she can move and manipulate those marbles into these spots to create her potions. So 
She can create small potions if she has two resources of the same color. She can create a large potion if she has two resources of the same color and any third resource. And then she can create, I forget what it's called, but it's a black resource for any three. All right, so those are the sort of the game boards. Let's see what else we have in the box here. So we have bags, of course. Uh, this is for the meeples before they go on the ships. And this, I believe, is for the alchemist for her marbles. We've got some interesting looking tokens here. So these tokens, this is an, for the AI. Um, that's a rat. <laughs> Not certain which that one's for, but these are for the, the players. So this will track your money, basically your victory points. And then we've got other tokens that will track your time on the, the main board. We've got some, some gems here as well as some black pieces. I think this is the Icker for the Alchemist. Um, and I do not recall what the gems are for. We got just some uh, clear acrylic standees, your different um, goods, whether they're large or small goods, sit on the standees, just to, so they present a little bit nicer. Let's see, lots of organizers. It's a very oddly shaped organizer, but I'm assuming that works out well. Got punch board here. All right, so punch board for the Chronomancer. Here's his portals. So when you put two pieces together, you'll have something like this. So if you were to go to this location, you would create either a red or a green small good and it would cost you two time because it has two time icons. These do flip over. And on this side, they're generally better. So again, same two tiles, but now it only costs one time to create the same thing. Here's different resources that the Chronomancer creates. All this punches out really nicely. No complaints there. Here's some of our ships. So you'll have to put all this together. You can see this ship here has a lot of pieces that bend and, and move around, but we'll have to as assemble these ships before we start. We got some flags up here. I believe these are coins. So this is money, some time icons, more cardboard pieces. Here is, I believe this is the, the alchemist selling board. So we'll have to put this together as well. This will be where her, all her, her goods sit on basically just to present them. More ships and more goods. Again, more alchemy goods. Here is the, the alchemist's sort of main board where the marbles will come down. You got these little spots that'll pop out. Again, more things to put together, which is gonna look great on the table, but it's gonna take you a little bit just to get all this together. So, Punched out all those little pieces. You'll have little rails that'll basically slot in here and it'll create two tracks. One that'll go this way and one that'll go this way. And the marbles will actually sit in those tracks. Let's see what else we got here. We got a piece of cardboard with some, it's been punched out. That's uh, wonder if I'm supposed to save that. We'll save that for now. Here are our meeples, very nice meeples. So the grays are thieves and we've got 
blue meeples, yellow meeples, and then green and red as well. Our marbles for the alchemist. Several different colors. These are not glass marbles. They feel plastic. They're still nice. There's nothing wrong with them, but they are definitely plastic. The dice for the blacksmith. So again, the black dice are those locked in dice. That'll be either one, two, three, or four, depending on where it is on the board. And then the four different colors for the rest of the dice. Here is the captain's wheel. So that one action that she can take lets her spin that wheel. And then I'm not certain, I guess that's on that side. Uh, let you take a certain amount of movement and then also let you uh, set down coins uh, on a location that she can go to later. Our figures, which are on the small scale. So four boats for the captain. They all appear to be the same. And then the actual figures themselves. So here's the captain. They are on the small side. Um, usually figures this small kind of, they don't have a ton of detail to, to them. This one isn't bad at all. You can clearly see her face. She's even got some, a little bit of definition in her hat. Yeah, these are not bad for the size. Here's our alchemist. Blacksmith. And then two figures for the Chronomancer because he has the Chronomancer and his apprentice. Let's see what else we got in here. We got some cards. So this is just an extra module. You don't have to play with it, but you can. And then the last thing we have is this deck of cards here. So we've got the people you can hire. There's a deck of those cards. So again, these cards will fill up those rows, fill up these different action rows that you have. Like you could put this one here if you wanted to. And then when you move your worker or your your main character on your turn. If you go to this action, which costs you two time, you can activate the entire row. As long as there is a, a worker behind the location, the location will activate. When you acquire these guys, they're going to give you um, some influence in the different guild halls, so the four different colors, and then they're going to give you an immediate effect. This one lets you get rid of a curse card. And these, these guild influence, I guess you could say, they have an impact at the end of the game. Basically, they allow you to score extra points. At the very end of the game, you're gonna look at the workers that are in the four different guild halls, even the, the, the thief guild hall. But in the, the four different guild halls, you're gonna earn points based on the number of workers that are there. And those workers are essentially the workers that get stranded on the boats that don't find a dock to get to. And then the thieves hall works the same way, except you get negative points. So you don't want that. So just the different helpers that you can hire or townsfolk. Uh, some of them give you, you know, large resources. Some of them let you move people on boats. What else do we have here? These lantern cards. It must be for the AI. So these are the AI cards. 
And then finally, about half the deck are curse cards. So curse cards, you're gonna draw from the top of the deck. Nobody's gonna know what you have, but some of them are just ones. Some of them are worse than that. So this one is two curses, but it also gives you one green faction, which might, might uh, counteract the negative points. So that's it for the base game. I'm gonna clean up and then we'll take a look at the different character expansions. And at the very end, I think we're gonna try to get everything back into the box the way they uh, describe it. So uh, I'm curious to see how all of this is gonna fit back in the box. All right, so we're back for the character packs. We have three of them. We have the Dragon Rancher, the Oracle, and let's start off with the Innkeeper. Again, if you have at least one of these character packs, the game will play up to five players. It will never go over five players. So if, even if you have all three, you can't play seven. So we've got our little character sheet for our innkeeper. It tells us how his particular board works. We got so the assembly guide for his 3D pieces. So he's got beds and looks like drinks that he's trying to sell. Here's his board itself. No double layering on this one, just flat. So here is where our beds would be up here and then our drinks. Again, all these spots are places you can put your figure on his turn and you're gonna activate that spot. And then we've got sort of his little action board. We got his figure. Probably my favorite figure so far. It's got quite a bit of detail in the shirt here that you can see the quilting on it. His character card for that expansion we looked at at the very beginning. More acrylic standees for his goods. And then finally, a few more customers to add to the, the pile. And that looks like it. Nothing hiding in there. So that is the innkeeper. Next, let's look at the oracle. Here's the guidebook for the Oracle. Oh, this is the biggest guidebook so far. It's got an extra two pages to it. I wonder if they have a complexity rating on these characters. I haven't seen one yet, but you'd have to think that she would be the most complicated one since her booklet is the biggest. More assembly guides. Looks like she's selling charms or something with a uh, runic symbols on it. These numbers you see are the value of the good. So whenever you go to sell a good to a ship, you're going to get that value for them. You actually get that value based off of how many of that color in a ship. So if you were to sell this small good to a ship that has three red people in it, you'd actually get nine coins for it or nine gold or nine points, however you want to look at it. This is interesting because this is a very large piece i know she has a um a bowl one of her pieces and i think this is it this is her she has like a bowl and it's it's got a divider in it and on your turn what you do is you you cast runes so she's got i think five items four or five items that she casts by throwing them into this bowl and then this divider in the center is going to split them into one half of the bowl and depending on what side of the bowl they end up on you can use them for different actions. It's actually really interesting. Here's her player board and wow, you can immediately tell that it's different from the other player boards once you, you feel it. I don't know if you can see it, just how much glare is on it, but this is definitely something you write on. Uh, there's, yep, there's a marker in here. So this is definitely a, the, the roll and write character. Um, really interesting board though, I really like the, uh, the crystal ball display there. 
a lot of stuff going on. There's her little action bar, like everybody else. Let's take a look at her figure. See her player card, more acrylic standees. And then, so these must be the things that she casts. So there's four of them. She's got a, like a little voodoo doll, a bone, and then two D4s. All right, so that is everything for the Oracle. So I know these boxes have to be a certain size because these boards are in them, but this almost feels like a waste that these boxes are so big. But let's go ahead and take a look at the last one we have, the Dragon Rancher. And I think all these expansion characters are supposed to fit into the, the main box. So these are big boxes that are probably going to get thrown away by a lot of people. It just seems, I mean, they're great for the art. The art is fantastic. I mean, these are nice enough that you could actually, um, you know, cut around them and make sort of wall art of them. They're very nice, but seem a little unnecessary. Um, again, more 3D assemblage. Here's our character, little cheat sheet. So it looks like, as you would expect, the Dragon Rancher is selling dragons. Um, so she's got a feed the dragons. She's got to clean up after them. She's chopping down trees, I guess, to make more room for dragons. Here is our punch board with all our cardboard. She's got a little pin for her dragons because you don't want those things getting loose. All her dragons herself. Here's the main board and her actions on it. player card. So she's got, I'm assuming these are food. These are either the food she's feeding the dragons or these are, these have got to be the food she's feeding the dragons. Let's look at our figure. I wasn't, you know, totally taken by the, the first four miniatures, but these expansion miniatures are even better. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the, the original four, uh, but for whatever reason, these expansion, these three expansion characters, these figures are, look a whole lot better, a lot more detail, a lot cleaner lines. I'm really liking these expansion figures. Let's see more standees. She's got a bag. I assume for all of those meat pieces. Got some extra dragon punch outs, some very cool looking dragons. We haven't talked about the artwork. This is the, the same artist that did the uh, West Kingdom trilogy, as well as Raiders of the North Sea. So some people really like his artwork, some people not so much. Um, I am not a huge fan of the West Kingdom artwork but I'm really liking this. Maybe because it's got a more fantasy theme to it, it seems more appropriate, but these are really cool. Let's see her little action board, and then what else we got in there? A little dragon that escaped. And that's it for our Dragon Tamer, which is the last of our three expansion characters. And then we'll take a look at the Secret Stash, which is Kickstarter stuff. All right, finally, we've got the secret stash, which is sort of the Kickstarter um, expansion slash stretch goals. I'm gonna assume that this is available for non-Kickstarters simply because, you know, they, they went through the trouble of creating a box for it. I've, 
I've had many Kickstarters show up and the Kickstarter uh, expansion stuff or the, the stretch goals is just like in a plain white box. So you, you're probably not gonna be able to find that on a store shelf. This, I'm assuming you, you're gonna be able to find if, if nothing else on their, their web store. So these are modules. So things you can include or, or choose not to. So we got new corruption cards. We've got rogue cards. A new set of townsfolk. Got rogue goods. Some extra boats. A lot of, a lot of extra modules. All right, so also we've got solo scenarios. So if you like playing solo games, this is a lot of scenarios that you can go through while you're playing solo. And they got different setups. They change different aspects of the game. This one changes the arrival phase, production phase. So a lot of a lot of playability for the solo mode in this one. More assembly guides for our boats, all of our new cardboard that we need for all our modules. We've got the pirate cards, I believe these are. So this will change the way that those uh, gray meeples uh, come out. And I think it actually changes their effect on the game sometimes. So at the start of the game, you'll draw one of these rogue cards and it'll tell you a couple different things. Um, I think this tells you how many rogues to put out in the top right there. I think five go in the bag and then Three go out onto boats, maybe. And then this changes what the rogues do. I'm not certain exactly what these, the iconography on these mean. I just know that it changes the way that the, the gray rogues meeples work in the game. But more really good art. So I'm liking that. What else we got here? We got some boat cards because we got new boats. So this is just a, an alteration to the setup for the boats. So the boats, this is sort of the base game. This is how you play the game if you're not including a module. You've got six boats. Each boat ho holds four meeples, three boats to the left of the island, three boats to the right of the island. And then as the boats fill up, they're gonna land in one of the three docks. If they're on the left-hand side, they have to go to either the left dock or the center dock. The right-hand side, they have to go to the far right dock or the center dock. And then just cards that alter that sort of startup. And then a two, which I assume can go anywhere. It's interesting. More meeples. We got, um, so that's a, that's one of the gray guys, although he's white. And then we got a, a green one, a yellow one, a blue one, and then that must be the red one. Must be one of the modules. I just don't know which one. And then finally, a new set of cards. So more townsfolk to hire. A lot more townsfolk to hire. Wow. Extra curse cards. And then these, which I don't know what these are for. Huh. 
clearly for one of the modules. I just don't know which one or what they do. But that's everything in the secret stash. Now I'm going to attempt to get all this back into the main box. So you might want to stick around for that. All right, we're back with everything now back in the box, or at least what I could get back in the box. And let's take a look at that real quick. So the organizer is very good at organizing what it will put back in the box, which sounds pretty obvious, but let's go ahead and go through this. So the sheets that we pulled off at first, these sheets here are exactly what they appear to be. They are organizing guides. Um, I actually see why they are this size now because they can lay on top of the organizers and you may want to move the organizers around. So um, they work in this way. One really nice thing is that it includes all the extra stuff as well. So all the cards, even the extra cards from the secret stash will fit into the organizers. They also left additional room. If you want to sleeve these cards, you're going to need that additional room. You can see we got all our spot for our meeples, various tokens. Here's our bag, which is hiding some more of our secret stash tiles. And then on the right here, we have all of our boats, including our secret stash boats, and then some extra things down here. Now these boats are really interesting and were a lot easier to put together than I was expecting them to be. They could have easily done, you know, six boats of the same, but they didn't. They made each boat unique, um, which is very nice. And you can even see how the little meeples sit down into it and are inset into the boat itself. So they don't move around if something were to happen. It's a very nice touch. Um, so those are very nice. And of course, again, all of the boats, even the extra ones from the secret stash fit in. Also, I will point out everything that needs one of these acrylic standees will fit with the standee in the organizer. You don't have to keep pulling the standees off, which is good because these are the type of standees that can really tear up cardboard. If you had to keep taking these on and off, it would get, um, ugly pretty quick, but not a problem here because they fit in the organizer with them. Uh, I will mention that I am missing a few uh, standees. Possibly I put them on things I wasn't supposed to, but I think I was short two or three, not many at all. So that's the first layer. And we'll put our little guides back on there. And then we have the other four organizers, which are for the four base characters. So we have the blacksmith, this is everything the blacksmith needs. All you gotta do is whoever's playing the blacksmith, hand them that box, they're good to go. We also have a chronomancer, same thing. With their little sheet on top. We have the alchemist. Again, everything fits great. Goes in there. The captain, I had a little trouble with. I couldn't quite get everything into the captain's box. It's a little fiddly. So their um, big goods, which are their treasure chests, I put in a separate bag and I'll have to um, store separately. But otherwise the captain's box will just slide in like so. And our little sheet on top of it lays a little, a little crooked here. I think I may need to play with the alchemist box a little bit just to get it flat, but it works. Now we can put all of our player boards on top, like so. I'll probably just go ahead and throw the, um, the expansion ones in there as well, because it looks to have enough space there. Obviously we'll need our board. We'll need our rule book and all that, but you can see how all of that fits in and fits in really well. It's a clever organizer. The downside is that we still have a lot of content that does not fit in that organizer. Essentially all of the expansion materials, all of the three uh, expansion characters will not fit in the base box. So you've got all your dragon stuff, your Oracle pieces, more dragon pieces, dragon pieces. You got a bag, 
you got the corral for the dragons, all the dragons themselves, the big ones. All of that will not fit in the box. It'll have to go in, hopefully one expansion box uh, will fit all of it. Uh, I did want to, I pulled this out a little bit just to show you kind of how this works. This 3D terrain that they include with the game, um, this is all it's for. And it's very nice and it's very clever and it looks great on the table. Um, and I'm not saying they shouldn't have included it, but I mean, this table, which you have to put together, not a big deal, but you still have to put it together. All it does is hold the drinks for the innkeeper. It, it's just a sale table of what he has available. Um, so not totally necessary, but it's fun um, and I enjoy it. And probably my favorite mechanic, which I talked a little bit about when we got through it was the Oracle. This is the Oracle's sort of a rolling apparatus. I don't know exactly how to explain it. It's her divining bowl, I guess. So she's got five pieces in total. There was a little coin as well, which has a, a leaf on one side and a skull on the other. And on the Oracle's turn, they're going to drop those in those and on what side they show up on determines what actions she can take. So this is probably the coolest little mechanic that I've seen in the game. And I just wanted to show it off, but that's everything for Merchant's Cove. That's the base box, Dragon Rancher, Oracle Innkeeper, as well as the secret stash. And one last thing, the secret stash has an extra secret. So if you have the secret stash and you've unboxed it, make sure you've gone through the entire box or you might miss something. And that's all for us today. Thank you for watching.